our, my formal introduction of Frank. And so let me just throw out a few words. Parkland, Sandy Hook, Columbine. And all I have to do is say those single words and they, they just carry this weight, right? One word, and, and we just all know what they mean. They mean terrible violence, um, tragic loss of innocent lives, um, heartbreaking acts against children and educators, demonstrations of terrible mental illness at a young age. And we all remember the Columbine High School shooting, uh, which was also, uh, most people don't remember this, but it was also an attempted bombing that occurred on um, April 20th, 1999. So 22 years ago, over 22 years ago in Columbine, Colorado. And I'm not gonna recount the details because it's, it's just not necessary, but events like these are enough to make you lose hope. And my guest tonight, Frank DeAngelis, was principal of Columbine High School on that fateful day. And he is beloved in his community for his leadership during that time. And Frank retired in 2014 after 35 years at Columbine. But he can't seem to leave his beloved school because he's, he's currently acting as a consultant for security and safety management. And he also spends a lot of time speaking to groups of educators around the world. Frank and I met in 2014 when we were speakers at a leadership conference in Chicago. And we were, and Jenny, you were there also. Um, Frank and I were just drawn to each other through, I think, this shared sense of mission to bring hope to people particularly to those who are suffering. And I'm so great, grateful that you're my friend, Frank, and thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Andrew. And it's, it's just a pleasure to be here, you know, and it is all about hope. And, you know, if, if you 20 plus years ago, if you would have told me a Columbine could have happened at Columbine, I would have said, no, it doesn't. And, but, you know, we came up with the motto, it's a time to remember, but it is a time for hope. And, I look back to where we are now. Um, there's been so many changes, and but we it's got to stop, you know. And I made a promise uh, that night that when I got home and just relived everything, I you know I told my brother I said there's nothing I can do to bring the 13 back, but we're going to go sh to make sure they didn't die in vain. And that's the reason, you know, that I'm doing the things I'm doing right now. And mm. you know, it would be like you said, Parkland, Sandy Hook, and all these others, we just can't give up hope. And, you know, and, and the thing that I really believe is that they're all of our kids, because people ask me all the time, what are you going to do? I said, what are we going to do? And I mean, each one is just tragic. And the thing that touches my soul each and every time I see the parents who lost their kids, they said, I wish I had one more time to hug them. I wish I had one more time to tell them I love them because if I would have known when they walked out of the door at seven o'clock in the morning, that'd be the last time I would have done that. And I think so many times in our lives, when I go out and speak so many times we wait until bad things happen before we tell people how we feel. And, you know, I hope that people know, and, you know, and that's one of the things that I'm doing in, uh, you know, every morning when I wake up before my feet hit the ground, I recite the names of my beloved 13 and what I'm doing right now is just to try to do good work for them. And it's just an honor to be here. And Andrew and Jenny, it's just fantastic to see you again. And I'm just glad to be a part of this. Well, you know, Frank, I was mentioning, I didn't want to recount the, the details of that day. Um, one thing I am curious about though, and, and just to, for everybody else, because we are such a small group, let's make this a conversation. You don't need to pop things in the chat. Just if you want to ask a question or, or share a reflection, please just, just jump in. This is a nice little informal group. But Frank, one of the things I was thinking about was, um, uh, how, how did you help people deal 
with things at that, at that time when that was all happening? How did you help people deal with things? You know, one of the things, <clears throat> and I'll tell you, even though during the Atlantic Columbine, you know, that the enemy was really the two shooters. And, you know, for all of us the past year, the enemy has been the pandemic. You know, it's taken us on. And one of the things that I learned and one of the things that I share right now, and the most important thing is if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of others. And that was the best piece of advice because right after everything happened, my world was falling apart. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I had a, a friend, my mom actually worked for him. He was a chiropractor, John, <clears throat> and he served in the Vietnam war. And he called me within 24 hours. And he said, Frank, you're going to be pulled in so many different directions. Everyone needs you. I mean, your, your kids, the community staff, but if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to help anyone. So I got into counseling and even 22 years later, it, and there's still that stigmatism about counseling because I actually had some people tell me that if you seek counseling, that's a sign of weakness. Well, it's not a sign of weakness. It's to me, it's a sign of strength. Yeah. And I would not be able to do some of the work I've done if it wasn't, you know, for counseling. What I tell people, because I've had people say, well, I don't need anyone. I have my wife. I have my significant other. I have my friends. And I said, well, if you broke your arm or leg, would you allow your wife? Now, if your wife or uh, husband's a doctor, that's one thing. But if they're not, would you allow them to fix or reset your arm? They said, no, that's crazy. And then I said, why would you not talk to someone professionally that can help you get through it? You know, so, you know, that's a key message I give. The other thing is finding things that to help over this past year. What have you done to take care of yourself? You know, and that was the thing. And, you know, for me, definitely my family is so important to me. The counseling piece of my faith is important. You know, these are things that really help me get through it and to offer that hope. And one of the things that I've said a long time ago is so many times in our lives, we dwell upon the negative, but I do not want to dwell upon it. I want to build upon the positive. And I think, you know, at times that, that was tough to find that, uh, you know, silver lining, so to speak, but it was really that type of thing, because someone once told me what, what I want in my life is I want energy givers, not energy takers. And unfortunately, I'm sure we all know people that we spend about five, 95% of our time dealing with 5% of the people that are so negative that you're not going to change them. And, and to me, I, you know, I would never be disrespectful, but I want to surround myself and I with good people. And you know, that was a lesson I learned. And then another one I think we can all identify with is we can all experience an event. Let's take the pandemic now, but how we deal with it, we deal with it differently. And I remember people that, you know, after Columbine saying, Frank, we need to talk. We need to talk. We need to do group. We need to do this. I had other people saying, as soon as I get back to doing what I was doing prior to this event happening, that's going to help me heal. And just trying to allow everyone to, you know, heal in their, their own way. And, and one of the things that scares me now, and I'm old, you know, I grew up during the Vietnam War. I was right towards the end of the war. And our country was divided, but I don't know if I've ever seen our country so divided. And, and it really mm -hmm. bothers me that we can, I mean, we can have different opinions, but we don't even take the time to listen to each other. And that's one of the things that I tried to do, keep us all together, because during tough times, it's really easy to be uh, divided. And, and I, I, that was one of my things to keep us together. And do you have thoughts on, on how we can do that? And John does have a question. So I just want to let you know, John, that I see you and, and um, want to at, let you ask your question. Uh, just first, Frank, um, do, do you have thoughts about uh, what we can do to I don't know, heal this uh, animosity and division. Because I know, I know another part of what you did before the tragedy at Columbine is you were very big about inclusivity and uh, connection and, and um, you know, cultivating a feeling of family between people and respect for people. So that's been a part of your way of looking at life and and as a leader for a long time 
what are your thoughts about this division? Well, and I, I think just listening to others, because what I've learned a lot of times, you know, and unfortunately, we've seen it on social media that people attack each other and without even knowing that person. And, you know, one of the things I learned a lot of times is the fact that many times we're saying, gosh, I can't believe they're acting like that. But it's that open communication, because we it's, we need to empathize because a lot of times we don't know why people are acting a certain way and taking time to find out. And it does take some extra time. And, you know, it's easy to reach out to those people that are supportive, but I try to reach out to those people that question some things just to open up. And I think so many times that's the issue be, uh, to find out where they're coming from. You know, I, I had people say, and I'm sure this has happened to you during the pandemic. You're saying, gosh, they're so angry, so mad and things like that. But when you sit down with them to take that time to find out what's going on in their life, you know, that a loved one, you know, could have been, they could have lost a loved one in so many things. And we don't take the time to find out about people. And I just think it's about caring and letting people know that you care. And, um, you know, and, and one of the things that I learned, and I truly believe this, and there's a quote out there is character and integrity is who you are when no one's watching. Yeah. And I think so many people that get up and why they get up in front of a crowd and they say this and all of a sudden you see them away off stage or off camera, wherever and say, boy, their actions don't match their words. And I think mm -hmm. people, you know, I, I used to tell my teachers this all the time. And I truly, truly believe this, that we can apply this to our life. I used to tell teachers, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. And that's important. And when I, and I don't know in your occupations of work, but I used to tell people and principals would kind of look at me and I said, I would never hire someone who was incompetent. But if I had two people walk into my office for an interview and one person, all he or she is talking about is I, I, I have this degree. I got this award. I've done this. Basically, I'm the smartest person in this school. And then I have someone that comes in that may not have that knowledge or the, the upper degrees, but if they talk about, you know, teen, they talk about kids, I'm going to hire that person because I can send that person to get the education they need to increase their knowledge. I can't give someone that caring attitude or that personality to love and care about people. Yeah. And I see this all the time that I could probably come to any of your states and walk into a classroom and within five minutes, I would know which teachers care because it's all about relationships, relationships, relationships with kids. Mm -hmm. So are you still in touch with kids from 22 years ago? Yeah. I it's there. You know, one of the things that hit me really hard is uh, I have, well, just to kind of give you some context uh, that night, uh, one of the hardest, most difficult things I had to do that night, something I was never prepared for, is after uh, they took me from Columbine, it was about four or five hours later after, you know, I was helping the police and I had to walk into this uh, auditorium down at the elementary school. And all of a sudden there were a lot of parents down there. But as the night went on, there were fewer, fewer family members. And I had parents and coming up and saying, Frank, did you see my son and daughter? And I had not. And I had a father come up and say, Frank, for about the last four or five hours, there's been buses continually bringing kids. There's no more buses. And that's when a counselor came over and said, Frank, you need to take these family members and you need to tell them there's a good chance their loved ones lost their lives. And I'll never, ever, something I was never prepared for and trying to find the words. And in our lives, sometimes you just can't. I could not say, gosh, I know how you're feeling because I didn't lose a child in the manner in which they did. And it was just being able to care about them. And I'll tell you, one of the things, building upon this relationship piece, um, I was trying to, people were giving me so much advice. And early on, people said, Frank, you better be careful. You're not, you better not be talk to those parents. There's potential lawsuits. And one of the things that I learned from my parents, and I'm so blessed, my dad just celebrated his 91st birthday and my mom's 87 and they're doing okay. But they taught me early on in our life, in my life, or our lives, sometimes you have to stand up for what is right, even though you're standing alone. And I, people were telling me, you better not go. Well, 
over that weekend, that next or the weekend, I went down to visit the homes of all those parents who lost their kids. Mm. And I didn't know the words, but I just, we cried and we held each other. And when the district, school district, they were upset with me. And they said, what were you thinking? And, you know, I'm full-blooded Italian, so I have a tendency to be stubborn. And about two weeks later, mm. I returned to those houses. Only this time it was Mother's Day, and I brought bouquets of flowers to the moms. Mm. And we shed a lot of tears. But I got to tell you, the relationship that I established, I have it now. And every year, I call the parents uh, on the 20th anniversary or the anniversary on the 20th to tell them I'm thinking about it. And where it really got to me this year is, uh, I think it was Danny Rohrbaugh's parents said, Frank, you know, we just celebrated Danny's birthday. I said, yeah, I know. It was March 2nd. She said, I can't believe Danny would have been 40 years old. And, wow. You know, they're all of my kids. And I'm going to continue and to protect them. And uh, we're out there to help each other. And I think the thing that we had is we were family. And I think that's what we have to try to do now is bring us all back together. How do we get through this pandemic? Yeah. Uh, John, you, you have a question. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Um, I'm wondering now that you uh, have, I'm assuming compared Columbine to a lot of the other school shootings, is there some kind of common denominator between the kids who killed their classmates? Was it that they had self, you know, self-loathing issues or is there something you know i'm a motivational speaker so and my platform is being different is your superpower so i'm trying to understand how i can potentially get to kids who might be <clears throat> leaning in that direction before it gets out of control you know that is such a good question because one of the things that i struggled with is I saw pictures of the two shooters when they were little kids, you know, second grade, third grade. I mean, just like any other little kid missing teeth with a grin that would light up a room. And then I saw the person pointing a gun at me, firing shots at me and some of my students. And all I kept thinking about is what has happened from the time, you know, they were these seven, eight year old kids to the time they turned 17, 18 years old. And, and that's such a difficult question because a lot of times, I think the narrative that came out after Columbine is these were two at-risk kids that, you know, they were picked on. That was not the case. And what made it so frustrating is these were kids that were honor students. These were kids that were in gifted and talented programs. These were kids, the thing that uh, haunts me to this day, we had our junior senior prom on uh, Saturday night and they were there, I still remember them pulling up in a stretch limousine and they're high-fiving me and they're dancing and the whole thing, knowing that on the 20th, they were gonna blow up the school and they could have killed a majority of the kids that were at that prom and, and they really were cold-hearted. And I really believe, especially the one Harris, uh, just looking at some of the things that he had planned, um, he idolized Adolf Hitler. You know, I think mm. that's the reason they decided to do it on the 20th. Uh, they, he talked about his audience and how, you know, the weaker race should die and things of that nature. But, you know, the question I think we all ask, and John, to address you, is how do we reach out to these kids that are crying out for help? And how do we notice uh, what they're going to do? And with the ones that what you end up seeing is, after the fact, you saw some of the things where they crying out for. They made these basement tapes in their parents' basement for over a year, uh, really laying out, delineating what they were going to do that day. And, you know, their whole just hate for, hatred for society. Uh, they made reference to Charles Manson. They made reference to Adolf Hitler. And you just don't know, you know, what's going on in I think one of the things right now that we try to do and when I do meet with groups and parents is a lot of these kids are broadcasting on social media and how much is sharing. I mean, if you turn to Parkland, there were a lot of warning signs by the shooter up there that was broadcasting. And one of the things that I hmm. tell people to do is, and I try to tell empower the kids if they see something, you know, they need to say something and as adults, we need to do something. But I, uh, it worries me right now with these kids and some of the things that are going on and we just need to be there for them and, and reach out and 
it, it's tough. So you don't feel like there were early warning signs with the with the two guys? Well, here's again not to put blame on anyone other than the two, but I'm just going to share a few details. And I think one of the things right now I worry about is parenting. And what I mean by that is towards the end of my career, I had parents coming up to me and saying, Frank, can you tell my son or daughter they can't wear that to school? And I said, well, you know, you're the mom. You're the, well, if I tell them they can't wear it, they may not like me. And I said, at times, we need to be parents. And one of the things that scared me is they were doing these videotapes in the basement, and the kid actually had a, a, a weapon in his duffel bag. And the mom said, well, what's that? Well, it's just a prop for the school play. About six months prior, uh, the Harris household, Mr. Harris, all your ammunition's in for April 20th. The dad says, I'm sorry, you have the wrong number. They were videotaping everything they were doing. And as time went on, they started gaining more and more confidence. They, they panned their room. And if I truly believe in my heart, if, if the parents would have walked into the room, I wouldn't be talking to you today about the event at Columbine. As a matter of fact, uh, when the police showed up at the Harris household, the first thing the mom said is you can't go in his room. No one's ever been in his room. And so I look at some of that and some of the things that we could have done differently if they would have walked into that room we may not be having that conversation. And so I think these are things that we have to look at and certain types of warning signs. You know, I use this all the time. These kids do not come out of their mother's womb hating, you know, what has happened in their lives and yeah. things that may have triggered the things. But I'll tell you right now, for any of you in your communities, if you have kids that are fascinated by the two shooters from Columbine, that's a red flag because in most of these instances that Andrew mentioned, uh, whether it be um, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech, they did it, they were motivated by the two. And so those two, which they said in their videotape, they said, we're gonna be cult heroes and we're gonna be remembered for the rest of life and we're gonna carry on. And unfortunately, a lot of these kids look for those two for motivation. Yeah, wow. When you talk, Frank, you're talking a lot to uh, faculty, staff, administrators in your, when you're speaking and when you're doing work, do you ever talk to kids? Do you ever talk to groups of kids? All the time. Okay. I really do. It's about caring. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I was supposed to be in Los Angeles. Um, I spoke at a school up there, St. Genevieve up near Hollywood, and I, I've done assemblies up there and I was really looking forward to it. But I talked to kids about caring about each other, you know, and, and one of the things, one of the most important uh, events we ever did at Columbine, because I'm really into creating this inclusive environment, it was a, really a wake up call. We had kids that were um, re referred. So basically it was put on by MTV and it was called uh, Cross the Lines. And it was an eye opener for me and the kids. So all of a sudden we had kids walking in, kids that, you know, were going to go on to Ivy League schools, kids that seem to have everything going for them. Then we had kids coming in that had body piercing and tats. And all of a sudden they walk in and they're looking at each other and saying, time out, what is this day all about? And there was a lot of hesitancy because they, they were so divided. Well, anyway, we start this activity and it was called Cross the Line. So I was involved along with some teachers and counselors. We're in the gymnasium and all of a sudden, one of the things they said is, how many of you have ever in your life had parents that were abusive to you? Well, all of a sudden, cross the line. Well, they cross the line. All of a sudden, these kids that seem to have everything going for them, you know, the 4.0 students, were standing looking at that kid who had body piercing was potentially a dropout. And so they continue to ask these questions. And one of the things that brought tears to people's eyes is all of a sudden they said, how many of you have ever thought of harming yourself or taking your own life? And 95% of the people, and we're talking staff members, and all these kids looked and they looked at each other and you just saw it. And all of a sudden, pre perception was not reality. And so many times in our life, we just assume he or she has so much going for them, but they don't understand some of the things. And so 
we did some things and I did an event uh, that really brought our community together. And one of the things I think in our schools, and this is whatever line of work you're in, you have a tendency to walk down the hall and you're gonna have those kids that are saying, yeah, we're Columbine rebels, we're family, this type of thing. But there were kids that didn't feel a part of that. And when, I, when we changed the culture at Columbine High School is when I walked outside the doors and there were kids over at the smoking pit, you know, smoking cigarettes, or there were kids over at the skate park and, you know, went up at the uh, food court mall. And I walked and I said, what are you doing? And they said, do you even know who we are? And fortunately, I knew most of my kids' names and I did. And they said, well, you tell us you care about us, but there's kids in that school that could care less if we ever walked back in. And that broke my heart because I was the principal and I let them down. And I said, I want you, we're going to have a meeting of all the kids that feel the way that you feel. And I said, I'm fair game. It's just going to be me and you and your friends. So they laid into me. There was about a hundred of them. It's not what I wanted to hear, but what I needed to hear. And they said, you know, you tell us you care, but what about your kids, the other kids? And they don't. And I said, well, you need to come to the next assembly. And they said, why would we come to one of your assemblies? All you do is you recognize the top students, you recognize the athletes, you recognize the kids that are in the marching band, where do I fit in? And so, uh, they showed up at the next assembly. And one of the things that I did that probably changed the culture at that school is I had, hold on one second. I gave every person that walked in the building that day for the assembly, it's a link, it's a carabiner, it says we're Columbine. So all of a sudden I'm getting ready uh, to do my little presentation and I had each of the kids pull out a link. And I, held, and I had them hold it up and I said, each of you at Columbine High School, there's 2,000 of you. We have 2,000 links and each link represents something special at Columbine High School. And I said, that's what makes it so special. And some people excel in the classroom, others excel here. And that makes us all these unique. It's kind of like as snowflakes, we all have these individual personalities. But I said, what's going to make us stronger moving forward is when you take... 400 links from the class of 2017 and all these individual characteristics and quality and you put them together. Now you have 400 links coming together. Now imagine when we take 400 links from the class of 17 and 16 and 15, we come together. Imagine how strong. And I said, I'm going to put on the song. We're family. And I said, by the end of that song, we're going to find a way to come together even though we may have different likes, we may have different personalities, we're going to find a way because we're all Columbine. Wasn't sure if it was going to work, but all of a sudden, by the end of the uh, song being over, we had 2,000 kids and staff members and parents in there, and they're holding up this link on both sides shouting, we are Columbine, we are Columbine. And so I said, I want you to remember this moment. I said, I'm going to put that chain in our hallway. And I said, when we go through school, when you're walking through these halls and you're having a tough day, I want you to look up at that link and remember that you're always connected to someone at Columbine High School. And then what I would do is I gave every senior who graduated that link saying, even though you're leaving Columbine, you're going to be a part of it. And it was establishing that inclusive environment that really helped us heal and go. It's just about establishing those relationships and caring about each other. As you were telling that story, there was a word that popped into my head. And <clears throat> by the way, I wanted to welcome Randy and Aviva. You kind of joined us uh, midstream, but we're really glad that you're here. And thank you for being here. And just to let you know, um, this is because it's a smaller group. Uh, if you'd like to ask Frank a question or share a reflection, just jump in because it's, you know, this is a conversation and it's a smaller group. So um, Frank, when you were telling that story, I, this word popped into my head, alienation, that there was that group of people that just felt alienated, the group of kids that didn't feel like they fit in, they weren't, there's the athletes, there's the uh, scholars, there's the band members, but they they didn't feel like anyone saw them, they didn't feel, that's what I was hearing, they didn't feel seen or valued that's that's right and you know one of the things i used to tell 
staff members, as I said, you may be that one adult that the kids need. And on the last day of my career, I had a kid come up to me and I was in the hallway and kids were coming up and I was signing yearbooks and a young man came over to me and here's a kid who came by my office every day and said, Mr. D, how you doing? Kelvin, how you doing? And he'd give me a hug. And you know, that was just him. And on the last day of school, my last day as principal, he came up to me and he said, thanks for being more of a father to me than my dad ever was. And it's those, you don't know wow. the impact that you could have on a kid's life, you know, and just by taking the time to find out about them or, you know, for me, I was amazed, you know, we were a school of about 2000 kids. And when I walk down the hall, all of a sudden someone comes by and you say, Hey, Johnny, how you doing? They turn around. Gosh, the principal knows my name. It's those relationship types of things. And it was the same thing. And one of the things that I did, uh, you know, I think right now in our society with everything we have with social media, send and text, you know, whatever it may be, we don't take time to really, I think back to when I was growing up, you know, whether it be your, your first love or whatever, I used to save cards and all these things because they were important to you. Well, I did something, um, it was pretty cheesy, but it meant so much. Uh, what I would do is I'm a pretty type A person. All you have to do is ask my wife, but I counted how many staff members we had. So we had 150 staff members and I counted the number of days from Thanksgiving, uh, to winter break. And what I decided to do is do a handwritten note or holiday card for every teacher and staff member. And so I would do about five a day because I wanted to personalize each card. And something as simple as that, I did not understand the impact because the first year I did it, teachers were comparing and staff members were comparing to see if I wrote the same thing. But yeah. then they realized I took time saying, you know, Mary, I heard your dad had a heart attack. You know, I know he's in recovery if you need everything. Or John, you're Mary, I know you're a grandparent. But it was really funny when I went to their offices, those cards were there. And the, taking the time, because what it forced me to do is go sit down with the food service people to find out about them and carry on those conversations. And it was funny when I returned, uh, I went to Columbine's graduation the first year after I retired. And I had staff members come up and I mean, they said, you know what we miss about you? And I'm thinking, you know, my motivational speeches, you know, my leadership. They said, no, those cards. And I realized they realized the important, it's the little things that can make a difference in a person's life. And I think that was the thing that you just don't, you, you take for granted. Right now we're in such a hurry. And this is one of the other things that I would encourage you to do. Um, I had something at Columbine, it was called the happy drawer. And so many times we have a tendency when things go, we remember the negative things and we forget about the positive things that you do in life. And what I would recommend you doing are those notes that are written by someone. Thank you for taking time to talk to me or thank you for doing this and putting me in those drawers. And on those days that you're having negative experience, pull those cards out to remind you of all the good things that you've done. Again, not dwelling upon the negative, but building upon the positive. Yeah. 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 I'm struck by the story you told about the young man who said you were more of a father to him. And I mean, what you were describing was you just basically said hello to each other, gave each other a hug, right? It's just taken time. You but know? That was more than he got from his father. Exactly. Just a hug. I mean, we don't know what anyone's going through. Uh, it's heartbreaking. It really is. And, you know, one of the things I'm doing consulting right now for a lot of the schools, and one of the things that I'm recommending, and I'm really worried, I, you know, teachers need to be trained to teach math and science. But one of the things I worry about is I've been telling these administrators, you better train your staff about social emotional learning. Because these kids returning to school are not the same kids that left, you know, dating back to March of uh, 2020 when the pandemic hit, you know, and you look at it and for some of our kids, 
schools were safe place for our kids. And all of a sudden you have oh. kids that are coming from households where there might be alcohol abuse or verbal abuse or things of that nature in school was a safe place. So these kids are coming in with, you know, some baggage and things. And so being able to reach out. And I, I do believe, you know, that all this online learning for these elementary kids that how is the brain developed or how has it been stagnant? So I think there's a lot of things we need to do to train these teachers to deal with the aftermath of this pandemic to make sure that we give these kids the emotional support that they need when they return. Wow. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. I have a question. I, I'm curious about, because I've heard um, some people say that they think that online school might be actually really good for some kids because they're not getting bullied and kind of traumatized when they go to in-person school. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about what it might be like with the transition now where kids are going back to in-person school and they haven't, they're going to be forced to have to be in those situations where like the, we were describing the kids that felt, uh, you know, felt excluded. Well, if you're online, you're not having to deal with all those social dynamics because kids can be jerks. I mean, let's just face it. Kids can be jerks. I mean, adults can too, but <laughs> to each other. Um, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are about if you're in your consulting work or hearing any conversations about how, how kids are going to reintroduce after all this time and sort of isolation. Well, and I think that's an important point. And I, you know, the one thing that I worry about, and I, I hear that about kids being bullied and going back, but I'm hoping that schools and communities have it set up. If this is happening, you can deal with it because to me, that social interaction is so important for kids and you're hoping it's positive, but I, I, I mean, just having teachers being able to talk to them or the social interactions and, and for some of those kids that are being picked on and bullying. And unfortunately, what we have seen is an increase in cyberbullying right now that's taken mm -hmm. place. Hmm. Unfortunately, um, this is across the country, uh, suicides amongst <laughs> teenagers has really increased. And that scares me because, and I think a lot of it has to do with the pandemic. And, and I was recently in Katy, Texas, and one of the things that really was disturbing to me within their school district, they have 83,000 students and they did threat assessments. But not only that, they had over 40% of elementary kids that had suicidal ideations within the past year. Mm. And I'm thinking, I mean, that was block, that was, it was higher than the high school kids, uh, the percentage. And that just scares me. What would, I mean, a kid that is, you know, seven, eight, nine years old thinking about hurting themselves. And that's why it's so important that we teach them how to read and write, but we also need to address the social, emotional needs mm -hmm. of these kids. And, uh, you know, the one thing that I do believe in education is all kids learn differently. You know, uh, one of the things when I was principal, we had our standard math class, whether it be algebra or geometry, but some kids really struggled with that. So we implemented more practical types of math. So we would have like a, construct, a, geom a construction geometry class where they would use the geometry concepts, but they would build things. And because they enjoyed building things, but they still learned how to do percentages, fractions and ratios. So I think providing an education that meets the needs of all kids, but I would hope for some of these kids that are being bullied, uh, boy, that they let their schools know that because a lot of times these kids do such a good job of hating it, but I, I mean, hiding it, I, I ju it just bothers me when these kids, these things are happening. You know, and one of the things that I really believe that we need to do is we need to give our kids skills that are going to allow them to be successful in the next phase of their life. And, I use this quote all the time. I think at times as adults, these kids have mountains to climb and what we want to do is move the mountains for them as opposed to giving them the skills to scale that mountain. Because um, what ends up happening, and I talk to parents all the time and I, I'm sure you heard this or you may be that parent saying, I'm really concerned because my son or daughter, 
they're going away to college, they're going to do this, and there's going to be so many choices they have to make. And I said, hopefully that you instilled the values in them that when those choices come up, they're going to say what is right and what is wrong. Yeah. Don, uh, you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, I think it's more commentary. Or comment. Certainly, yeah. certainly um, listening to Frank has stirred the brain. So th there's a there's no s simple answers here, but um, universally, maybe you've heard of self determination theory, where people, regardless of age or settings, need a sense of autonomy. They can make some decisions on their own. They, they need a sense of confidence that they, there's something you were talking about the kids who are out smoking and they said, well, what do we have? Well, we need to help them find what that is, that confidence. And uh, a really important one is connection, which they were also feeling. And that scares the heck out of me when we talked about doing video schooling all the time. It's hard to do a, a connection, but those three things are essential for emotional and social learning, for for healthy minds. So one of the things that contributes to all of this is the lack of parenting in the sense that people just become parents. All you have to do is give birth and you, you're a parent. Well, nobody's, nobody's taken it seriously to say, you know, we've got some classes to help you. Parenting is tough. There's a lot to understand, psychology, sociology, you know, age group changes. That's a tough job, but we don't we don't teach that. We just say you're on your own, and some people fail, and some people do well, and some people we don't know why their kids turned out the way they did, one way or another. But the last point I want to make is I feel very strongly that gun violence is a pandemic. It kills thousands of people a year, probably tens of thousands. It's as much a health crisis as a, as COVID. And we need to start treating it like that. We can't keep dismissing it. Oh, you know, it was it was the people, not the guns. And it was, but anybody can have a gun now and anybody can respond in a heartbeat, lose their cool and say, you know, the way to do this is to kill somebody, to shoot somebody. Or I'm feeling neglected here. I'm going to get some attention. So I'm going to get a gun and I'm going to go kill people. We need to be serious about this. We can't just keep dismissing it because we like contributions to elect politicians. It's a pandemic. It's a health crisis. We need to address it that way. Thank you. And thank you, Frank. Thanks, Don. And uh, Don, you really, so, and something I want to touch upon about the parenting piece and what I saw towards the end of my career is not only parenting classes, but I, I have seen more grandparents now that are assuming parentship roles because uh, for whatever reason, the parents are not around. And now you could imagine, and this is not that, that grandparents are not loving and caring, but I look at myself, you know, you get grandparents that have, did not have to deal with all this social media when they were raising their kids. And now they're trying to raise teenagers Within, with all of this, and I think there has to be parenting classes, not only for parents, but also grandparents mm. and caregivers, because they, they haven't, they, it's been a while since they raised their kids. And I think these are all the things, and Don, you bring up some very, very valid points that uh, there's all these, you know, when I look to this gun violence and everything that's going on, I think the thing that we got to look at, there's, I, I refer to it as a jigsaw puzzle. And Don, you touched upon the gun thing. You know, one of the things that I wonder is why does someone need a 30 round magazine to go hunting? You know, things of that nature. And, but in addition to that, I really get concerned when I hear school districts saying, uh, you know, we don't need counselors. We don't need social workers or psychologists in schools. No, we do. That's just as important as some of the things that are going on in the classroom. So, and then parenting and social media. So when you put all these pieces to the bustle, then we have a chance of combating some of these things that you mentioned, Don, of some of the violent acts that are taking place. It, it's, it's gotta stop. I mean, I, the Parkland kids really did a good job when they said enough is enough. And, and, and they were, 
I think, Don, you were alluding mm -hmm. to this because I met with those kids and they said, with all due respect, you adults have been telling us you're going to fix it. You're going to fix it. Well, it continues to happen and nothing's getting done. And I mean, and they really went out and tried to do some of the things that they're doing, you know, and getting them out, you know, speaking. But one of the things that I told them is they, you know, they came to me and said, give me some advice. And I said, right now, the cameras are on you. And they said, the cameras are going to be on for us the rest of our life. I said, no. And they said, well, then how do we change things? And I said, then you need to go out. And if you want laws changed, you need to make sure that you're electing the officials that are going to support the things that you're stating and getting your friends to go out there. Or later in life, you're the ones that need to run for these offices. And so these types of action. And, and I, you know, I think as adults, at times we have let down our kids. I'd like to ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, you know, I have a few friends in my neighborhood with kids. Um, a lot of them are, have just graduated and going on to college. And you talk about the um, having counselors in the school. And that's a really good idea. But just recently, well, five boys actually over the last year and one most recently about two weeks ago committed suicide. And, um, you know, I asked the, my friend's daughter, well, are there no counselors in the school that can help? And she said, oh, they don't help. They, you know, she has a negative connotation. She didn't feel like she could go to the counselor. Um, and maybe these other kids don't either. So I don't know how that really works. I don't have kids myself, but it made me sad that these kids cannot, they don't feel like they can go and speak to their counselors in the school. And that, that hurts me, because that yeah. should not be the case. And, you know, one of the things that I, I did a pretty good job, I, I mean, what I think one of my strengths as a leader is I could relate to the kids pretty well. And I used to tell them to find that adult in the building. And it could be a counselor, but just being able to go talk to a teacher or talk to the building manager, just being able, all it takes is that one good adult that's able to listen. And it's how you, it's how you develop that climate, you know, that these kids know. And I think a lot of it in schools and unfortunately the larger the school, the more difficult it is to get that inclusiveness. And so, but you can't give up and you can't work upon it. And I think if, if you live it each and every day with the staff, and I tried to role model that it's important because these kids, you don't know what's going on in their mind. And, you know, and one of the things that uh, really worries me at times is sometimes, especially now, everything we went through, the kids are going through. And I think back to my own life in when I was an, an adolescent and just thinking this is the worst thing ever. And so many times these temporary problems by these kids taking their own life, it's a permanent solution and teenage suicide and suicides in general just it, it really it, it's devastating when it happens and we need to figure out and and what is happening and it sounds like what may be happening here is what i found out working with these kids a lot of the times these kids there are these packs that they're making that you know they're going to oh, do yeah four kids are going to do it together you know and uh and that's why we can't we've got to make sure that we reach out and you know, one of the things I think a lot of times the people were surprised, I think, when kids enter high school that, you know, parents feel, well, they're older now. They don't need me as much. I tell I used to tell the parents they need you more now in high school than they ever did. That don't give up on their life, you know, continue to be involved in their lives. And that's one of the things we do and letting them know you care about them. And I think that's so important. Jennifer has a comment or a question? Well, I have a question. So, um, you know, when you were talking about how wonder how you hoped that your kids would go find any adult in the building, and you've talked about your ability to relate to them, and they clearly trusted you and would come to you, but did you, and you role modeled it, but did you explicitly set the expectation for the rest 
of the adults in their orbit? Did you have conversations or training classes about it? Because I would wonder, Aviva, like what's the culture in the school that these kids are in that A, there's counselors that aren't trusted. You know, there's some something broken there, but um, you know, it, yeah, so I'm just curious from a leadership perspective, what you did to instill that so that you weren't the only, you couldn't have been the only adult they trusted in the building. We, we brought people in training for them. And that's one of the things right now that I have been expressing to the school people that I've been working with. You need to train your staff in this social, emotional things of dealing with kids. And you just can't expect it. I mean, you have to train, just like if you want to teach a new math, you need to bring in math teachers to train them. It's the same thing, bringing them in to train. What are we going to deal with? What are kids going through right now? You know, generational things and things of that nature. And, and if you expect people to do it, I mean, you can give them all the words you want to give, but you need, they may not know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and one of the things... Uh, not to dwell upon what, what we had after Columbine, but we had to change the way we taught. I mean, simple things. Our parents decided when we went back to school, they were gonna put an archway of balloons up, blue and silver, great idea, until the balloons started popping and kids started oh. diving on the ground. Oh. You know, uh, we could not serve Chinese food because that was a meal that they were that, that they were eating that day. So these are all the things I had to train the staff to look for, you know, and it looks like, and Don, I think put something up there. The other thing too, that we had at Columbine that worked out, we were one of the few schools that we had peer counseling program because a lot of times uh, peer to peer, they would talk. But at that time, but we still, if you do something like that, then you need to make sure that you train the peers because you know, one of the things that happens if a kid comes up to me or any of the staff and they said, you know, I'm thinking about hurting myself or, you know, I'm at home and, I, and my parents are abusing me or this is going on. A lot of times you, you tell kids that, yes, this is going to be confidential, but there's certain things that I'm bound by law that I have to report. And I think that's where the training things comes in. But that peer, I can't tell you the number of times that if, if they, if you, we used to send our kids, we used to do peer retreats and we used to train them that we would bring kids in to talk to their friends or peers, because a lot of times it's a lot easier. So there's so many different ways, but you have to have that support there that it's just not one thing. And a little bit about the training. And I think Jennifer, what happens a lot of times we used to send our counselors because so many of the counselors are career counselors. And they can help kids with choosing colleges, uh, writing essays and things. But have they been trained in social emotional counseling? Right. So we actually had to send our counselors to be trained in that because most counselors will help with their schedules. They'll help with college credits, things like this. But can they deal with a kid who comes in and says, I'm feeling anxiety or I'm having these thoughts? And But you have to train them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a good point. Well, we are, we are at the end of happy hour, but I wanted to um, just ask you, Frank, if you would, um, would you tell us a little bit about the um, Columbine Memorial Foundation? Uh, because ladies and gentlemen, this is um, the, the uh, charity that we're partnering with for this happy hour. There's no obligation but if you uh, choose to, you can make a contribution to the Columbine Memorial Foundation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the work they do, Frank? Sure. And uh, if you ever, and I will, in the chat room, I'll put my phone number. If any of you want to get a hold of me and have specific questions, uh, be more than happy to do that or my email. But one of the things, the Columbine Print Memorial, um, we waited about seven or eight years we didn't rush into it. We really put time in and we got the input of the parents who lost their kids, the people that were injured. And we knew that we could not have the memorial on school campus because it's still a school. And, you know, the thing we did not want is people, they needed to visit this memorial, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we could continue to have school. 
So we built this Columbine Memorial and it's beautiful. It's on about two and a half acres just to the north of Columbine High School. And it's beautiful. Uh, the little inner circle that you saw right there, each of the parents wrote something about their kids. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it's just beautiful. And um, they do about that. There's comments made by the students. And we have people that come from around the world. I mean, literally come from around the world to just see it. It's a place of reflection. They, it, it is just beautiful. But the maintenance to keep it up and things of that, that's what the memorial goes towards. And we continue. But it, it really is. And so if you ever come to Colorado, please give me a call and I'll give you a personal t a tour over there. It's just beautiful. It faces the Colorado mountains. And it's something near and dear to my heart because it reflects all the families and, you know, what they lost that day. But uh, I think in reading a lot of the things that are surrounding that, each of them gave the hope that if you read the things, uh, and also this is not, God, I feel awkward saying this, but I published a book a couple of years ago, and it's called, They Call Me Mr. D. And in all the proceeds from that go to the Columbine Memorial. But the last chapter of the book, I actually took all of the information the parents wrote about their kids. And it's really, it's mm -hmm. very touching. And it talks about that recovery piece and those parents, it, it, it really is awesome. So it's near and dear to my heart. And I know the memorial will be around a lot longer after I am, but it, it is. And so if any of you feel you'd like to contribute, it would be for the maintenance and upkeep of that, but it really is important to the Columbine community. And not only that, I think anybody that comes there, it helps with the healing. And so if you would like to make a contribution, all you have to do is go to happyhourhope.com and there is a donate button there. And 100% um, of the proceeds go to the Columbine Memorial. This is not a money-making venture for me or anyone. And um, Frank, I just thank you so much. It's, it's so great to see you again and spend time with you again. Um, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for the work that you're continuing to do and giving hope. Um, I would like to uh, put in a plug for next month at Happy Hour for Hope. My guest is my good friend, Rich Sheridan, who is the co-founder and the chief storyteller for Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It is a small uh, software development company, but um, they do amazing things. It's an incredible company. Rich has written two books, Joy Incorporated, How We Built a Workplace People Love. And his last book, his most recent book is Chief Joy Officer. So um, Rich's, um, Rich's company is a pretty incredible place. And you just got to hear what it's like at Menlo Innovations. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for being here again, Frank, thank you so much. And um, we'd love to see you all again next month for Rich Sheridan and God bless.